Hi, I'm Kirk Evans, Principal Premier Field Engineer with Microsoft. In this section, we'll look at the SharePoint hosted app model for SharePoint 2013. Looking at app patterns, there are three different app patterns that make sense. First is the SharePoint only app. And these are apps where you use only SharePoint artifacts. An example of this type is an enhanced link list where an ISV might create an app and upload that to the Office Marketplace and provide the ability maybe for the user to open links in a new window. Or maybe even a, a training sign-up app where it could be an internal application that allows employees to sign up for training classes. In both of these instances, we'll create declarative artifacts and upload those to SharePoint and they're stored in the content database, either on-site or in SharePoint Online and, and its content database. And the start page um, for the app can either be on-premises or in SharePoint Online. And in this instance, the tooling that you'll use is client-side tooling. We'll use things like HTML5, CSS, JavaScript, jQuery, or even using Silverlight technologies. So again, in SharePoint hosted apps, we create artifacts and upload those to SharePoint, and those live inside the content database, and we are restricted to only client-side code. Now if we look at cloud apps, this is where we start to really take advantage of the capabilities of this new app model. This is where we can use cloud-based resources for data storage. An example might be an airline status application. An ISV might create an application, upload it to the Office Marketplace, and through this app you might be able to get your flight status for any airline vendor. Or maybe you have an extranet and you might have created an internal application that allows authenticated vendors to gain access to necessary information to work within your company. The data here is not stored in SharePoint artifacts, so the data will be stored in databases stored by the ISV or maybe in Azure storage belonging to the company. This type of app only uses server-side technology, and you can add client-side technologies to make it a hybrid app, so you could actually have a mix of both SharePoint artifacts as well as cloud-based resources. A hybrid app is actually really interesting to look at because it combines the two models together that might have some cloud storage and also some SharePoint artifacts. An example might be a photo printing application where an ISV creates and a user purchases this through the Office Marketplace and it might contain a custom action that attaches to a picture library. When you click the picture library, it takes you to the other app that performs additional work, such as maybe ordering prints. Or maybe even an external list where it's created by the company and their customer database is stored in Azure and surfaced through an external list in SharePoint. This is the most flexible option for allowing just about any technology where we can store the data in different places and have various start pages for our app defined in the app manifest. There are three basic types of app experiences. The first one, every app will implement a full page app experience. The user will click the app and then can see an entire page, an immersive experience for the app. Again, every app is required to implement this. We'll take a look at that a little bit more throughout the course to see why that requirement and other different ways that you can leverage parts of your app to surface inside the SharePoint host web. And the way that we can surface parts of your app inside the SharePoint host web is using a concept called an app web part. You're not required to implement an app web part, but it's a nice way for users to be able to embed parts of your app inside the host web so that bits of functionality can be added to a page. Another way that you can provide a, the user the ability to use your app is by extending functionality inside SharePoint through a custom action. Again, this one's not required either, 
but it provides yet another possibility for users to interact with your app. An example of a custom action might be an additional option in a drop down menu that applies only to a particular document. When they click your link from the context of that document, they're taken to your app where they can provide additional functionality. So let's look at that first type of experience, the full page SharePoint app. Full page apps provide an immersive experience that consumes the entire browser. When a user clicks the app in the SharePoint site where the app was installed, the browser is redirected to the app start URL. The developer provides the app start URL in the app manifest when building the app. The idea here is that in the SharePoint site where the app is installed, the user will click that app and be able to be redirected to the start page URL of your app. And that will be surfaced through a full page immersive experience. The second option that we introduced for surfacing functionality inside the SharePoint host web was to use what we call a SharePoint app web part. This allows us to take pieces of the app and show it in the host web. While doing that, we need to keep in mind a few things about how iframes work because that's exactly what we're doing is taking bits of the app and hosting it in an iframe. One of the things that we'll need to consider is this notion of the X-frame options. X-frame options provides a clickjack defense. A, a clickjacking is a technique that some hackers try to use to trick users into clicking buttons that appear to perform safe or harmless functions, but instead perform unrelated tasks. Clickjackers embed malicious code or redress the user interface by using transparent frames that overlay specific UI elements with misleading text and images. This might be like when you see a dialog pop up that looks like it's from your operating system, but instead it's trying to get you to click to go somewhere else to do something malicious. To help prevent against clickjacking attacks, website owners can send an HTTP response header named XFrame Options with the HTML page to restrict how the page may be framed. One option for that is to deny. And if the XFrame options value contains the token deny, Internet Explorer 8 and above prevents the page from rendering if it is contained within a frame. This is important because the apps that we create send XFrame options headers. And this is the fundamental building block of how the app web part works. If the value contains the token same origin, Internet Explorer will not render the page if the top-level browsing context differs from the origin of the page containing the directive. Blocked pages are replaced with a this content cannot be displayed in a frame error page. In order to address the X-Frame options in our app, we can use the allow framing control to enable the app to run inside a frame. This ensures that we will be able to show our app in an iframe in the host web. We'll need to make sure to use the allow framing control to enable our app part to be able to be seen in the host web. In order to make apps easily accessible to users and feel like they belong to the site, apps can specify parts or static HTML or even a small page to surface in an iframe. This information is used to populate a generic web part called the client web part. That information is surfaced inside the host web as if it were a normal web part. Users would then be able to add and interact with app parts just as if they were normal web parts. Another interesting way to surface your app functionality is to create a custom action. Custom action defines an extension to the user interface such as a button on a toolbar or a link on a context menu. A custom action can be used to surface your app within the host web, making it feel like it is a part of SharePoint. Command extensions can then be used to define additional capabilities such as adding ribbon buttons or controls used to trigger apps. To understand SharePoint hosted apps, there are a couple of key concepts to understand. When deploying, 
All of the components are SharePoint components. This allows you to define and deploy SharePoint lists, site columns, content types, or in SharePoint 2013, even workflows and external content types can be deployed as declarative assets as part of your app. The programming API it uses the client-side object model and RESTful API. And you can surface your app using the client web part as part of your app. The key thing to understand though is that the developer's toolset uses the client side tooling, it uses HTML5, CSS, JavaScript, or you can even use other types of libraries, maybe Knockout, jQuery, whatever client side technologies. The key is no server side code can be deployed as part of the SharePoint hosted app. It is only SharePoint artifacts and client-side code that's deployed as part of your app. In the previous slide, we talked about SharePoint hosted apps and that they can only use client-side code, that they cannot be used to deploy server-side code. This includes assemblies, code behind, and code beside. We're not allowed to use server-side code with SharePoint hosted apps. And you can see an example of an error message that you would see whenever server-side code is attempted to be executed via an, a SharePoint hosted app. So let's take a look at a demo of using SharePoint hosted apps, how we can surface functionality using client web part, and how we can also surface functionality using app custom actions. We'll create a new project and this will be our app for SharePoint 2013 called Hello App. Provide a friendly name, a URL for debugging, and the hosting type. And the hosting type for this demonstration will be SharePoint Hosted. Visual Studio creates the project structure for us. And we can see that there are four modules that are created. There's the content module that contains our style sheet that we'll use to provide any styles for our app images and this is where an icon has been generated for our app that would show on the site contents menu where the app is installed you can provide your own icon here and then the pages module now the pages module contains a default.aspx page that is used to provide the visual structure for our app so let's investigate that page a little bit more if we scroll down, we can see that some script references have already been added for us for jQuery, the SharePoint uh, runtime, as well as SharePoint.js. There's also a reference to the style sheet for our app where we would provide our own styles, as well as a script reference to the script file where we would provide our logic for our app. So let's scroll down a little bit. Inside the placeholder main content placeholder, this is where you would provide the visual structure for your app. And some markup has been generated here as a sample for you. You can either use that markup or create your own. We'll just augment it to create our own uh, div with an ID of display div. And then we'll uh, update the contents of that in just a moment. We'll also provide an input type is equal to button. And this will allow us to uh, allow the user to be able to click a button and then when they click the button we'll replace the contents of that display div. So we'll tell the user that this button should be clicked and then finally when it's clicked we want to call some JavaScript and the script function that we'll create will be called hello and there we go. We don't want to provide the script implementation here in this file instead let's go into the scripts module. And you can see that jQuery has already been added to the project for us uh, as a matter of convenience. You don't have to use jQuery. There's no hard dependency on using that. It's simply introduced here as a matter of convenience to make building the apps that much easier. So let's go into app.js and we can see that some example JavaScript using jQuery has already been created for us that uses the document ready uh, function that obtains the client side object model client context. From the client context, we get the web. Once we have the web, we'll get the current user. And then finally, when that succeeds, we'll replace 
the contents of the element that has the ID of message will replace its inner text with hello and then the user's title. So that's a quick example of using jQuery. Let's create our own function here called hello. And inside that, that function, we'd like to be able to use jQuery to look for the element that has the ID of display div. And we'll use the same technique. Instead of replacing the text, this time we'll set the inner HTML to be paragraph tag hello apps. Close the paragraph tag. And now we can even add a breakpoint and then press F5. And when we do, Visual Studio, if you watch the output window, will install the app, upload it, install it into SharePoint, and then once it's installed, we'll launch Internet Explorer and attach the debugger to that instance of Internet Explorer. We can see that uh, some jQuery is already run behind the scenes and the, the JavaScript implementation uh, used the client-side object model to obtain the current user's name. Well, let's call our own function. We'll press the button click me and we can see the breakpoint is hit and then if we continue through and we go back and inspect the page our logic ran successfully and we can see that the text was indeed replaced with the uh, with the text hello apps next is we'd like to show how to expose parts of this app inside the host web to do that let's add in a new item when we add this new item, we'll add in a new client web part. And the client web part allows us to expose a page from our app as an iframe inside the host web. So we'll create a new client web part called app part. And then we're asked if we want to expose an existing page or to create a new page that will be exposed in the host web through an iframe. So instead of using the existing page, let's create a new page called app part source. Now, as this page is exposed as an, as an iframe, we'd like it to look and feel like the uh, using the style of the host web. And that's exactly what this script that was created for us does. It uses the style sheet of the host web to be able to use the same look and feel. So it looks like the web part is actually part of SharePoint. So inside this client web part, what we'd like to do is let's go back and look and see what was created for us besides this script. Let's look at the elements XML, the element manifest. And inside the element manifest, we can see some uh, markup has been created for us that defines the client web part and its properties. To inspect that, let's reformat the document a little bit so we can read all of the different properties. And we can see that we can provide our own title here. So my app part, we can get rid of that title. Let's provide our own description. We can set the default height and width. And now we can see that also the content and the content for this client web part is pointing to a page. So what we can do is we can provide some more properties of this because as we edit the web part and we, we see the, the web part editor, we'll be able to provide our own properties on that web part editor and we'll need a way to pass those from the web part editor to our page. And we'll do that using the query stream. So to use the to use the question, what we'll do is we'll define a new uh, a new parameter here called display message. To do that, you can see the syntax right here. So let's use similar syntax, and we'll say message equals. And the syntax notice that it it uses the uh, this this syntax the using the underscore to determine the property that should be dereferenced. So let's call this display message. But to define this property, we'll need to go under the properties section and create a new property. And the property's name will be display message matching this right here. And the next thing we'll want to do is to provide what is its type. And the type that we'll pass will be a string and then we can set some properties that will be familiar if you've developed web parts in the past, such as web browsable is equal to true. 
we can say the web display name is equal to display message. The web description. And now we'd like to uh, tell it what category that this property should be displayed in. So we'll say the web category is equal to configuration. And the last thing is we'd like to provide the default value for the web part. And the web part's default value here will be hello client web part. Now, while we're defining our property, we can also say whether it requires the designer permission or not. So um, do we require that the user modifying this has, has at least designer permission? So we're going to say is equal to true. All right, now that we've defined our property, we are passing it inside the query string and we've set all the different properties here. The next thing that we'll need to do is to provide the logic for this. So let's go into the scripts section and we'll add in a new item. And this will be our app part.js. And then let's go into the web and go choose JavaScript file. So it'll generate a JavaScript file called app part.js. And inside the script, we'll need to provide a couple of different functions. The first one will be hello app part. And inside that we'll want to, to obtain what is that message that was passed in the query string. And we'll do that using a function that we'll write in a moment called get query string value. First we want to format the JavaScript correctly. There we go. Next is we'll want to uh, find the element that has the ID. And we could use JavaScript or we could just use, directly manipulate the DOM. There, again, there's no hard requirement on using, the, uh, using, the, using jQuery here. In fact, we'll just use uh, direct DOM manipulation to set the inner HTML equal to the, uh, let's set a paragraph tag and append a message. There we go. So now we'll need to define this function of get query string value. And you'll see this function written in um, a number of different examples on MSDN. So rather than just copy and paste it, we'll just kind of walk through the implementation so you understand it. The first thing that it'll do is um, obtain the parameters unencoded, and then we'll split based on the query string character, right? So the question mark inside the URL says everything on the left um, references the resource, everything on the right is the is the query string. So after we split the query string, we'd like to be able to get the element, um, everything on the right of it, and then split everything there by the key value pair delimiter, which is the ampersand. So by having the, uh, now what we've done is we've split and created the the key value pairs into an array called params um, and now that we have those we can then go through each one of them and determine if uh, which one of those has this name so to do that let's set up a variable called params and then we'll use a for loop and we'll just iterate through all of them and then we'll look for params dot length and then after that we'll increment our counter and inside this loop, we'll need to look for a single param, and then we'll split it by the uh, key value delimiter inside the URL is going to be an equal sign. So we'll split by the equal sign. And then finally, we're going to test to see if the single param, if it equals to the param name, and if it does, then we're going to return the decode URI component, single param, sub one. So now we have our get query string value parameter uh, function defined that will obtain the parameter inside the query string. We also have our implementation. The last thing we'll need to do is let's go back to the markup for our page that was just generated, the at part source page. And we'll scroll down that and we can see inside the, inside the body, what we'll need to do is to provide the visual representation. So we'll have a div with an ID of app part div. And inside that, then let's, let's add in a new input. Type is equal to button, same as we did previously. And then we'll say the value is push me. And then finally the on click equals hello app part was the name of our function. 
So now that we have a div called app part div and we have a button, we also need to add a reference to the script that we just created a moment ago and we'll do that inside the head section up here. So we'll just go into scripts and then look for our app part.js and add the reference right like that. So now that we have our app part.js and we're looking for the element app, app part div and we'll replace that inside the inside the markup down here we'll replace app part div whenever this button is clicked the last thing we should be able to do is to run it so we'll set a breakpoint just to make sure that inside our app part.js that we're actually getting that value and then we will run our project Visual Studio then launches Internet Explorer and then we can see that the start page for our app is the is the full page immersive experience the default.aspx let's go back to our site and this is the host web so since we're on the host web what we'd like to do is to be able to add in that web part as part of that page so let's modify the page and we'll insert a web part and the web part that we'll add will be my app part and we can see there's the description a sample client web part there's the title my app part so let's add that to the page and there's our app part with our button that we provided previously so let's save that now if we click the button we can see our JavaScript is in fact called the the breakpoint is hit we hit F5 and now we go back to the page we'll be able to see there's our hello client web part now if we edit this page again let's edit the page and let's go inspect the, um, the our ability to manipulate this so we'll edit the web part we go down to the web part editor and we'll see there's a section configuration if we expand that there's our display message property that we defined and there's the default value that we provided so let's update this with we can edit the value of a client web part click OK and when we do that there is the value of let's save it first click the button step through go back to the page and there is the value that we just provided inside the web part editor and while we're here another interesting thing that we can inspect is if we go to F12 the developer tools and we open that up we'll be able to use the uh, use the selector to select an element by click and then we can go click that and we can go inspect to see how is that implemented and one of the interesting things here is how the the app part is exposed is using this iframe so there's the iframe as we click it we can see that the iframe is selected and if we scroll over we'll be able to see that the source is actually in fact pointed to our app part source page so that's a quick look at using the client web part. Now let's take a look at how can we use the uh, use the ribbon to be able to provide the implementation for our app. So we'll close Internet Explorer and that will stop debugging. And the next thing we'll do is we'll add in a new element here, new item, and new item will be a ribbon custom action. And we'll name this ribbon custom action launcher. It asks where do you want to expose the custom action in the host web or in the app web and we'll choose host web and we also want to uh, to know where is the custom action scope to is it scope to a list template an instance of a list or nothing we'll choose the default the list template and the template will be um, one of these different types of list templates that we can say any for any of these that this ribbon button will be available on and ours will be a document library so we'll just find a document library and we'll attach our button behavior to it and ask where is the control located and we'll choose to see that it will be under ribbon.documents.manage and then the label text for the button here we can simply say that it will be go and then where does the button control navigate to and we'll control the navigation will go back to the immersive experience for our app default.aspx choose finish now that we have the ribbon we should be able to just simply hit f5 to de to start debugging again the app is installed uploaded to sharepoint visual studio attaches the debugger and now we'll go back to our site 
we'll go into documents and under documents we can go in under files and under files there's this ribbon section called manage and sure enough there's our new button go as I click that new button go we're taken to the immersive experience for our app we click the button and again we're able to continue debugging so that was an example of how to launch a, an app using the ribbon and how the ribbon button is provided on different document templates in the host web. So in this module, we discussed SharePoint hosted apps. We talked about how to surface the functionality of your app. And we also discussed the types of code that you can deploy as part of your app.